Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Gerken, and I'm a member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee, and I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. I'll be your moderator. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions at any time, please, during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. Our guests will respond to those questions as they pop up throughout the webinar. So um, feel free to po excuse me, post those as they uh, come up. You can turn on live transcript and choose um, show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. The session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the a, um, Arizona Library Association YouTube channel and a link will be provided in the follow up email and feel free to share that link with your colleagues and friends. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can con contact her via the chat. So just post in chat. If you're unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. And I think it got posted in chat as well. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is just two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data and prove our offerings to you. And your feedback is important to both us and to the participant and to the presenters. Uh, membership. So uh, your participation and membership at ACLA is really important, and we'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit www.azla.org for additional information. Thank you so much. And we also are um, requesting submissions for upcoming um, professional development events. So the Professional Development Committee is seeking proposals for 2023 webinars. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You'll find a link in your webinar follow-up email. And coming up, we want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Develop Committee. On July 13th, join us for We'll Be There For You, Getting Tech Help at Your Library with Connect Arizona um, with Brandon Knight and Erin Lorandos. This webinar will feature a breakdown of services and resources offered by the Arizona State Library's Connect Arizona program, including remote technology tutoring and assistance with di digital navigators, online tech learning, and proctored assessments with North Star Digital Literacy, a free public Wi-Fi map for Arizona, information and help on the Affordable Connectivity Program, ACP, application, and much more. Registration for this web webinar is posted to the AZLA calendar, Arizona State Library calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. And today, we want to thank you all for attending. So please welcome Rita Baladad, Tracy Glau, Sam Myers, and Bridget Whiff for the presentation Bottoms Up how early career librarians and archivists united to empower each other. Hello. Hi, and welcome to Bottoms Up, How Early Career Librarians and Archivists are United to Empower Each Other. And we are so glad that you are here. Please be present. In other words, please turn off of your email, move your phone out of the way, and try to interact as much as possible. So a little bit more about us.
Um, my name is Rita Balladad. I'm the Electronic Resources Librarian, and I have been with NAU for about a year and a half. And I've been in librarianship for probably about 20, 21 years. However, I've never been in a continuous appointment or tenured position. Over to Trace. Hi, everyone. I'm Trace Glau. Um, I've worked with books since the early 1990s, but then found my way to library work in 2006 in technical services, where I'd been working until last year. Um, I'm new to the librarian group. I just earned my master's in library science in 2022 and was fortunate enough to uh, get a position as the librarian. So I'm newest to the group. Over to Sam. Hello, I'm Sam Meyer. I'm the lone archivist on this team. Uh, I've been in this role at NAU since 2019, around the same time that Bridget came into her current role. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. And Bridget. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Bridget. I've been in libraries for about a decade in public and academic libraries, but I was hired into this role in 2019. And in case anybody was with our in-person presentation in October, um, you might be noticing that some faces are missing. Don't worry, they still work at Klein. They're just busy with their own super awesome projects right now. So enough about us, what about you? We would like you to introduce yourself. So in the chat, can you please tell us your name, where you are, and what item in your refrigerator would make the best bookmark? Yeah. All right, let's see that chat light up. We're using Zoom webinars today, so we can't see your beautiful faces or hear your voices, but we'd really, really love if you could participate in the chat. Um, I know for me, it's probably slices of zucchini that would make it super oily, but they're skinny. Cross. Someone said cilantro. That's brilliant. And aromatic. Very mm -hmm. aromatic. I kind of botanical. Is dry enough that it would make a decent bookmark. Oh, good call with the celery. Oh, tortilla. Yeah, probably mm -hmm. a little tortilla. less messy. Tortillas, well, nice. <laughs> Deli meat. <laughs> Thank you so much for participating and feel free to continue the chat while I'm chatting. So a little bit about Northern Arizona University and Klein Library. I'm just going to refer to Northern Arizona University here on out as NAU. NAU is a public research university of 27,000 students located in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a mountain town with 75,000 people. Uh, Flagstaff is on the northern part of Arizona, um, somewhat close to the Utah border. NAU has a new president, Jose Luis Cruz Rivera, and you can see him on the slide. And he's been with NAU for about two years, and with that comes a retooled university mission and vision and new priorities. NAU also has a branch in Yuma and we share a library in Phoenix called the Phoenix Bioscience Core. So we're everywhere in Arizona. And this is Klein Library. The university has one building to serve the entire Flagstaff campus and that's Klein Library. As of summer 2023, Klein Library is staffed by 40.75 full-time employees. 22 of the employees, including the university librarian and two assistant deans are classified as academic professionals. And NAU is unique in that all of our academic professionals are librarians or archivists. NAU has one full-time librarian in Yuma and one full-time librarian at the Phoenix Bioscience Corps. And over to Sam, who's going to tell us the roadmap for today's presentation. So today we're going to be bringing you through four guiding questions that we'll first pose to you to answer through a Jamboard. Uh, perhaps you've used those before. And then we'll share how we answer these questions for ourselves. So the first question is, what problem are you trying to solve? What's the gap or frustration in your workplace that you see that you'd like to address? The second question is, where can you advocate and bring these things up? Is there an existing forum? Do you have to create space for your issue? 
who at your institution can help? Is there anyone who is sharing in this struggle with you or has a similar issue to deal with who could help you out? Third question, what do you need to learn in order to be an effective advocate? Is there any documentation you need to read, institutional history you need to bone up on, plans or policies that you should be aware of because they dictate your work environment? And then finally, how will you know if you've succeeded? What will tell you that you did something to concretely improve your working conditions for yourself or for others? Next slide. So for you, we are going to move over to a Jamboard activity and I'll just give you all a few seconds to move on over there. It should be in the chat, tinyurl.com backslash AZLA bottoms up. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and move on over to the Jamboard. And hopefully in front of you, you see AZLA June 2023 webinar bottoms up. What problem are you trying to solve? What is a gap or frustration you'd like to address? For those of you all who are already familiar with Jamboard, please go ahead and start writing your thoughts and ideas on here. And for those of y'all who are not too familiar, on in Jamboard, how do you put something on there? On the left-hand side, you will see a toolbar. And the two things that I'm going to point out for today are the little um, piece of paper. It kind of looks like a paper or a page with a dog ear and it's called a sticky note. And so if you just click on that, you'll see that you can write something on there. So one thing that I wanted to know about is um, software. Um, how do I sign up? What do I need? And then you just press save and voila. And to get out of the sticky note, you press cancel. And the other way that you can add something to this Jamboard is with the text box. And so you can just write something on here, like um, one thing else that I wanted to know. Um, what do I need for tenure? That seems like a pretty basic question. And I did not really know that when I started. I just knew I needed to get it at some point and I had four years to do it. Let's see here. What are some of the things on here? Some of the professional discrepancies between staff and faculty within the library system. So how is it different between being a librarian and being a faculty budget issues always budget issues i love creating a pipeline from staff level positions to librarian level roles that's been a big deal in every library i've worked in and bridget and trace can both speak to that continuous yeah. promises for pay studies to be finished ah very important that's this one train versus Clarity on stakeholder roles. We have so many gaps in knowledge and if not frustrations, concerns. Mm, train versus train. When are you up for promotion? These are great. It's nice to see someone mentioned archives because one of the librarians here is an archivist. I know, appropriate space, what problem. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, you can continue to write on there, but I'm going to stop sharing for now and I'm going to go back to our presentation. So we will return to your questions at a later point in time. So as Rita said, feel free to keep adding. So over to us. So what problems were we trying to solve? What gap and frustrations did we address? Confusion among other things. <laughs> so, um, sorry, that just totally threw me off. <laughs> um, in the words of Sir Topham Hatt, the wise Sir Topham Hatt from Thomas the Tank Engine, our problem was confusion and delay. Um, there were five of us hired in 2019, 2020-ish, right after some new standards for evaluating promotion and tenure qualifications were voted on along with the rubric. 
And to be fair, it makes total sense that there would be requirements that are written down for these things and to, um, to implement those for new folks. So the problem that we were trying to address wasn't necessarily the new standards themselves, but the lack of understanding around them. And we found that the folks who we might normally go to for guidance, they hadn't been required to go through these same standards, so we couldn't really get clear answers, and we were stuck trying to figure out some things on our own. Um, to make matters worse, these were in the early COVID days when communication was even more disjointed than usual. So where we started, um, us new folks decided we needed to have a talk. We were in different departments across the library, so as you've noticed, even the four of us have very different roles. Um, and we thought it was important to connect and compare our notes. So we expected our onboarding and training experiences to be different because we had different supervisors, different expectations, but there were so many inconsistencies that we came up with a list of questions to present to leadership for clarification as a group. And these casual Zoom and email conversations became a Teams space that was private where we could talk to each other and an ongoing support group where we could encourage each other's growth, vent about frustrations. I found it to be really helpful having this mini community where we could validate each other's experiences and really lean on each other. So let's go to the next slide. So like I mentioned, onboarding was a pretty significant frustration for us. And after talking with some veteran librarians around the library, we learned that the onboarding confusion wasn't exactly new or unique to us. Um, and when I started as a librarian, I was given a really short checklist of things that needed to be done within two weeks. So these were meetings, run-throughs of software I needed to use, um, our reporting system, tech setup, everything was just in two weeks. And there was also a spreadsheet that leadership used, which was kept privately in SharePoint um, that closed after that two week period. So as new folks, we had ideas for how that onboarding process could be improved and standardized to make sure that everybody had a successful start. And so a mini working group formed where we were able to take that feedback from the new APs and that old spreadsheet and work with some colleagues to turn it into a year long onboarding process. And that's the link up in the top right in that QR code is to our new onboarding spreadsheet. This is a somewhat older version than there is a newer one, but this one's pretty anonymized and it was our first draft. So this one, it's a year long, it doesn't close um, like the other one, and it's available to the new hire. Tasks are clearly assigned, so the new hire has the ability to follow up in case steps through, fall through the cracks. Since it's split up by time frame, they also are able to make sure they're staying on track and take some ownership of their own onboarding. Plus, we were able to add in some new means of support, like a first year performance review, substantial feedback from the tenure and performance review committees, and adding on a designated mentor that I know those things will be touched on a bit more later. Um, and Trace is going to talk about her experience using the new spreadsheet versus the old. So uh, Bridget talked about the then, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the now. For me coming in, Truly, I benefited from this group's work. Um, so I had a clear understanding what I need to do to progress in my job. Um, the onboard process was easier to understand. Um, because I had access to the onboarding checklist, I could communicate with people. If meetings were canceled, I didn't have to wait for them to come to me. I could look, I could see who it is, what department, what we were meeting about, and I could pursue it. And then in addition, having a longer time to do the on onboarding really gave me as the new employee uh, an easier time to understand and really absorb, trying to absorb everything um, in a week or two, it's just overwhelming. And so that was a huge uh, benefit. All right, and now it's time for participation again. So for you, where can you advocate and bring these issues up? Who at your institution can help and who shares in the same struggle? Stop sharing and switch over to a Jamboard.
So what you should see, hopefully, is the second page of the Jamboard. If you don't see that, there's some little arrows at the top. You'll see a little box that says one out of four, two out of four, et cetera, and you can use those to navigate to the next page. Staff Council, I know that we are all invited to staff meetings. Also, maybe um, you're meeting with your supervisor on a regular basis. And even if you aren't invited to committees, perhaps you can ask for notes and or ask to um, have your idea included in, in an agenda. Um, so you don't even have to be sitting on a committee to participate. Um, I try to nose my way into things uh, like that. Library HR, other new hires, peers. I like this note that says many share the struggles, but some are better than others at compiling gripes into arguments. <laughs> yes, yes. In transformation. Yeah, some of us are a little bit more diplomatic than others. <laughs> Lean on your coworkers. These are fantastic. I'm going to stop sharing for now and switch back to our presentation. So for us, where did we advocate and bring these things up? Who had our institution help and who shared in the struggle? The Council of Academic Professionals. And what is that? Sam will tell us. What even is that? Great question. I didn't know for the first six months that I was here, even though I went to all the meetings. So the Council of Academic Professionals represents workers at the library like me who are classified as academic professionals. And basically, CAP, which is how we shorthand that, so I don't have to keep saying the whole name, is the voice of academic professionals to the dean of the library and to the broader university uh, community. CAP has a representative that sits on faculty senate, for example, and CAP can represent the needs of academic professionals in other ways. Academic professionals are what librarians and archivists who have those continuing status or tenure eligible positions within the library are called under it, the ABOR policy that governs our university. And CAP itself began in 1983 when ABOR stripped away faculty status from librarians and archivists across the three state institutions and reclassified us as APs. Um, academic professionals are similar to faculty, but a little bit different in a lot of the procedures and policies that govern our work. And so CAP exists to set those policies and procedures and to make sure that we're doing everything in alignment with what the Board of Regents requires. Um, so there are a couple of key subcommittees of CAP one is the Committee on Academic Professional Status, or COPES. And what COPES does is it's basically a peer review group for academic professionals. So every year during your annual evaluation process, COPES will write a peer review, uh, evaluating how well you did your job and what kinds of feedback they have for you as you work towards tenure. Um, there's also the Policy and Procedures Committee, which manages key documentation like the promotion rubric that Bridget mentioned before and other documents. And now, which will, this is a little sneak preview, there is the Committee of New Academic Professionals or CNAPs, which other folks will talk more about. I lied, I will talk more about it first. <laughs> so CNAPs began as that informal a uh, support group that Bridget mentioned where a group of us new academic professionals were getting together to discuss common issues and needs. And after we had been meeting together on an ad hoc basis for several months, this group of us decided that it would make more sense to create the Committee of New Academic Professionals or CNAPs as an official subcommittee of CAP so that we could represent our specific needs to the Council of Academic Professionals through a more formal structure. And Rita will talk more about how we did that later in the presentation. 
Next slide. One of the first activities related to CNAPS and related to that onboarding work that Bridget was describing was that we started sketching out along with other post-tenure academic professionals, a mentorship program, a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program for people who were new to their roles. And we call that the CAP Buddy. Um, what we suggested, Bridget had had the experience of having a departmental mentor when she started, and she had found that really useful to her. No one else who was hired in that time frame had had any kind of formal mentorship within their department or within the library. So the group of us who were working on onboarding suggested that we might create such a mentorship program to welcome new people to the library, and further, that we might make this a formal mentorship program based out of CAP. So CAP would maintain the documentation, spelling out what the expectations for mentorship were, how long it lasted, what kinds of activities it would include, all of those kinds of things to create this peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. And then we also started thinking about cohort-based mentorship so for the group of people preparing for promotion and tenure at the same time period. Next slide. All right, and we are back to the participation um, part of this presentation. For you, what do you need to learn? Are there any documentation, history, plans, or policies? And I'm going to switch over to our Jamboard. In front of you, let me go over to the third frame. What what do you have left to learn? Is there any documentation, history, plans, or policies? Why were certain decisions made? Specifically ones that put new staff as a disadvantage institutional history around mentorship programs. Still learning about CAP here at Klein Library. Yes, my certain decisions not made. I'd like to get a better understanding of our library's onboarding policies and practices. What were the old workflows before building new ones? There's always something left to learn. There's so many known unknowns and still unknown unknowns. Where are places to look at policies and procedures? And yes, it's always plural places. I didn't even know what this thing was called SharePoint um, until about, oh, a year into working here. I'd been told that there was something called your point, but confusion. Who's actually in charge of what? Yes. And what are the minimum requirements for librarian and archivist level roles? What makes somebody competitive? Interesting. All right, I am going to switch over to our presentation so that you can see what we did. So for us, in terms of things that we needed to learn, um, there were a lot of documentation existing out in the ether, as somebody mentioned, that's always in multiple places from both Klein Library and larger NAU documentation that we felt like we needed to become experts on. So next slide. Those documents were the CAP handbook, also known as our conditions for academic professional service, basically our employment requirements, um, the bylaws for CAP and the rubric for continuing status and promotion. Um, so we went through these with a fine tooth comb to make sure that we understood every single thing that was in them. And it sounds like super duper boring work. I get that. Um, but the truth is, it's the best way to become well acquainted with your rights as an employee and make positive changes in a way where they can be institutionally recognized. Oh, no. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you need me to repeat anything? I'd be happy to. 
I can hear you just fine, Bridget. Okay, great, great. Um, awesome. So I know that there's also going to be some discussion about, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Anyway, um, part of this work was also to become well acquainted with how the documents were organized, not just the content, but like Rita mentioned, SharePoint was very difficult for us to navigate. So one new academic professional took it upon himself to reorganize that whole thing, put a glossary on the front, made icons so that we could actually find things, made it really, really user friendly for somebody walking into this as opposed to having to dig through documents to find links. Um, and also knowing what wasn't in those documents was super helpful because it helped us build a case for what could be added as a way to support new librarians. I can be heard. Thank you. <laughs> That's always what I want. On to Sam to talk about how all of this fits in with the larger NAU mission. Yeah, so speaking to that strategy question, of course, as Bridget mentions, we have these specific policies and procedures that govern our work, but we, like everyone else, are operating within a broader institutional context, and our institutional context is that of the university. So as Rita mentioned at the top of this webinar, many of us started, especially Trace and Rita, some of the newer folks started when we had a new president, President Cruz Rivera. And one of the things a first uh, university president does when they come in is do a new strategic plan, different from the old strategic plan. <laughs> so in May of 2022, after months of planning with community and campus stakeholders, President Cruz Rivera formally presented that new plan, NAU 2025, Elevating Excellence. And the good news for us is that one of the strategic priorities that he identified for NAU was to recruit, retain, train, uh, and support mission-driven and diverse faculty and staff. So it's real small here, but part of elevating excellence is specifically about supporting faculty and staff economic, physical, and mental well-being. So this new charge at the university level lent legitimacy to what we were doing, and we were able to align our activities with this university-level priority. For example, in our current operating plan for this upcoming fiscal year, Klein Library has resurrected a goal from several operating plans ago to establish a learning circle to explore and implement practices and programs that enhance recruitment, retention, professional development, and evaluation of library employees, which is a goal that CNAPS both suggested to library leadership and will support. Next slide. So for you, how will you know if you've succeeded? What does I did it look like? Let's switch over to the Jamboard. That one, what will success look like? I know one I'm going to put in here. Salary adjustments. Questions are easily feeling confidence in ownership. Yes. Making an environment in which new younger colleagues feel supported and empowered. Very much so. staring at these little blue screens and I'm like, wait, what's in there? Staff retention, that is a big one. I would think leadership would really like that one. I just won't be heard, but have some changes actually be considered and perhaps even implemented. Less discomfort over cross-departmental collaboration. These are great. All right, I am going to switch over. 
back to our presentation. So for us, how did we know we had succeeded and what did it look like? Another committee, yay! It's the Committee for New Academic Professionals. Huzzah for us. And specifically, we formalized the Committee for New Academic Professionals, and I'm just gonna call it CNAPS because it's a lot. So in April of 2022, so just last year, at a monthly meeting of the Council of Academic Professionals, remember CAP, the CAP meetings that we have to go to every month, a group of us new employees proposed to make CNAPS a formal group. And here's the responsibilities we listed in our lobbying effort. Assist in the cultural, interpersonal, and practical onboarding of new academic professionals. Identify and develop partnership opportunities between the new APs in order to build cross-unit collaboration and improve the Klein Library scholarly output. Identify and promote opportunities for new AP professional development and growth, and advocate for the needs of new APs within CAP and Klein Library. And you'll notice that this is a little bit kind of like formal language, and we did that too to mirror the university's mission and vision statements. When we proposed this, um, a few of our colleagues had questions. And so we cited the Council of Academic Professional Bylaws. Remember, we said one thing that you can uh, look at is policies. Are there any policies that can help support what you're doing? And in this, we saw a line that said, standing and ad hoc committees are created and dissolved as needed. So CNAP. In the end, the motion to create the Committee for New Academic Professionals passed and several people who were already tenured voiced their support. And so why were we really wanting this to be formalized and why is that so important? Giving name to something confers existence for one, and recognition from those in power conveys legitimacy and it validates your work. Additionally, the rubric for our continuous appointment includes the categories of professional service and mentoring, coaching, and teaching. This committee and our objectives and what we are doing fit squarely into these categories and counts toward our continuous appointment or tenure. And, create, create, and more so, one other thing is that creating this committee also avoids clicks. We might not come together as, as friends, but we can come together as colleagues. All new librarians are automatically invited to this committee, but active participation is optional. Over to Trace. All right, so just to kind of recap the CNAPS timeline um, in 2021, in fall, confusion and uncertainty reign, as you've heard. But then we start seeing some ideas being solidified by spring 2022. There was the actual formalization of CNAPS. Um, I arrived in June 22, so I was very fortunate on the timing personally. Um, in fall 2022, we looked at the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and it's very successful. So we're continuing that into the future. We're looking at continuing workshops, discussions and helping and supporting each other to reach continuing status. And now Sam and Rita are gonna talk a little bit about spring 2023. Huzzah, spring 2023. So three of us on this call are up for a uh, continuous appointment in 2024. That would be Bridget, me, and Sam. Um, and there are various things that need to be done with that. One of that is that we need to put together a packet. So um, it almost looks like a dissertation, a thick stack of things that say um, why why uh, you are worthy of continuous appointment, what you have done, your body of research work, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Bridget, Sam, and I are um, will be holding regular meetings to check in with each other to see how that process is going and having um, basically a writing group um, to get this work done. Something else we've done, yeah, it's going to be really fun to write a giant job application that's basically like, I would like to keep my job, please. Thank you. 
Um, <laughs> but something else that we've done as CNAPs that we're looking to continue into next year is that we've started hosting speakers, hmm. either from within the library or external to the library, but still at NAU or at sister institutions to talk about their experiences in their workplaces. So for instance, we hosted a round table of academic professionals who have already gone through the promotion and continuing status process so that they could share any insights they had, tips and tricks for us to get our resumes to look okay, all of that kind of thing. And we're looking to continue that into the, the next fiscal year. Next slide. So, yes, how CNAPS helped me. As you all know, I'm the newest to the group. So literally, couldn't have been better timing. Um, the main things that helped me, and some of this might be kind of a recap, the assigned buddy. Within one week, I had an assigned buddy. It was invaluable to have that buddy. Easy to go to, ask questions. I didn't feel like any of my questions were stupid. Um, well, I don't with any of the librarians. Everyone's very approachable. The onboarding checklist. It was real clear. There wasn't any mystery. Oh no, what am I missing? Did I do everything? Um, certainly very helpful. Um, having the onboarding process be longer. I think Bridget mentioned when she was hired and maybe Sam and Rita as well, it was like a week or two? Two weeks. To, yeah, it, it's too much. You're trying to get settled into your job, get your desk set up, let alone all of that. So having onboarding be longer. Um, it also enabled me to learn from the group, which was great. And it helped me understand library organizations when specifically much more clearly. Next slide. In wrapping up, the next step for CNAPs are procedural revisions. So the AP rubric comes up for review this year. It's a three-year cycle. Um, so I'm on the committee with Sam for that. Uh, CNAPS members continue to take officer roles in CAP, so we have the former, the formal leadership roles, encouraging each other to have that culture of transparency, information sharing, supporting each other. Um, something that Bridget had said is that new APs will join a culture that never existed before. So now we're all involved in keeping tabs on what's happening in the process. There's not this huge gray area. Of course, research, writing, and scholarly support. Um, regularly scheduled meetings to keep communication open, also offer support to each other. And having an emeritus member is very helpful for the entire group as well. And in conclusion, next slide, Rita. We'd like to take a moment to thank everyone. We'd like to hear your questions or thoughts. Um, I'd love to hear. We looks like we do have just real quick. I'd like to invite AZLA to pause the recording for the Q and A, um, so that we can take some frank and honest questions and respond in kind. Um. Oh yeah, it's at Fort McDowell, Arizona, at the um, Wicopa Casino Resort. Thank you, Matt. And so, um, any. We've got two minutes, so any final salient advice or final statements from you all before we go? You are not alone. You are not Thanks, alone. <laughs> Reach out. That's a good one. Thank you. So thank you all for being with us today. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar and hope you all have a great day and a good rest of your summer. <laughs>